The instructional designer devotes lots of time during the analysis and design phases of the instructional design process to clearly identify goals, skills, and steps of instruction. After the skills are separated, sequenced, and associated with performance objectives, the designer begins to develop the instruction for the goals. Much effort was put into understanding the type of knowledge and cognitive domains that the objectives are in and researchers have learned that the methods used to teach various types of knowledge can make a huge difference as to whether or not learning will take place. In the last chapter, we looked at some successful techniques for teaching facts and concepts. Now we're going to look at ways to teach another type of objective, procedures. In her book, Developing Technical Training, Ruth Colvin Clark talks about the importance of using a structured approach for developing classroom instructional material. Let's take a moment to look at some of the things Colvin Clark suggests we do when developing instruction for teaching procedures. Simply put, procedures are a series of clearly defined steps that result in achievement of a routine job or task. Sometimes people use the terms procedures and processes interchangeably but we don't want to do that. As instructional designers, we desire to be a bit more precise in the definitions and steps that we use to ensure that we are successful with developing instruction. That said, we'll want to be specific when it comes to teaching procedures and processes. For the purpose of this course, let's consider procedures as clearly defined steps of a routine job or task that is directive in nature and processes as descriptive items, which tell learners how something works. We'll talk more about processes later, so for today, let's auger in on procedures, which are considered a series of clearly defined steps to perform a routine task. Procedures are typically completed more or less the same way every time they are performed. They are usually laid out in a step-by-step -step format and are very linear in nature. Sometimes procedures have decision points in them where a choice needs to be made which may lead to another procedure. So when we think of procedures, we can think of two types. Linear procedures, which are the same steps each time, and decision procedures, which are procedures that include multiple linear procedures. When you think of developing instruction to teach procedures, you'll want to be sure to construct your instruction such that you are teaching the learner to apply the procedure rather than remembering the steps. Your focus should be at teaching to the apply level rather than to the remember level. To do this, make sure that your objectives are written to support performing the task rather than remembering it. For example, your objective may be written like this. The learner will be provided with all the equipment necessary to perform the steps in the XYZ procedure. Rather than, the learner will list the 10 steps in the XYZ procedure. If necessary, go back and modify your objectives to better describe and develop objectives for teaching procedures. Experts such as Ruth Colvin Clark suggest that when training for procedures, use three instructional methods. Clear statements of the procedure with an illustration, a follow-along demonstration, and hands-on practice with explanatory feedback. In preparing to teach the instruction, define each of the steps as a discrete action and start each of the steps with an action verb. Sometimes procedures are long and complicated. If such is the case, break the procedure up into multiple smaller procedures using a guide of no more than 12 to 15 steps for each procedure. And if possible, try and test a rough draft of your procedure with the intended audience. When procedures are taught in the classroom, it's not uncommon to provide a manual that 
the learners can follow as an instructor demonstrates the procedure. Often this is followed by hands-on practice for the learners. This is a very common technique that has been used with much success. As an instructional designer who may develop the manual for a procedure, consider these notes. Construct a manual that uses an action table. Action tables are often characterized as containing three columns, including a step, an action, and an example. The manual can be laid out such that there is a brief introduction at the top of the manual that describes the importance of the procedure and when to use the procedure. The action table will often follow this brief introduction. If your manual uses illustrations, be sure to keep them close to the words that describe them. Earlier we identified procedures as either linear procedures or decision procedures. When developing decision procedures, be sure to use decision tables. Decision tables come in an if-then-else format, and many designers provide flowcharts for the learners to follow. Decision tables are often embedded into action tables to show a consistent flow in presentation of the procedure. If your instruction uses a follow-along demonstration, be sure to provide a listing of the equipment and resources which will be needed or used to perform the procedure. Sometimes the designer will be preparing instruction in an e-learning format rather than for a traditional classroom. When developing for this type of instruction, Colvin Clark suggests that the instruction be detailed including all the steps. It should also be brief and sequenced to hold the learner's attention so that they can follow along with a simulation. Make e-learning of procedures flexible where possible so that the learner can choose the steps based on their experience. For example, your e-learning may have a skip this step option, which provides a more experienced learner with some additional control. And for teaching procedures using e-learning, use audio, which will explain a corresponding video. As they say, practice makes perfect, and using practice when teaching procedures works. The instructional designer should consider integrating frequent and regular practice in the instruction. Practice will go a long way in supporting the performing rather than the remembering aspects of the procedure. If the procedure will not be performed on a regular basis, be sure to provide the learner with a reference guide or job aid, which can be used before or during the procedure. One of the most common resources to support performance of a procedure comes in the form of a training manual and the instructional designer may be the one to develop the manual. If a training manual is already in place for a procedure, the designer might consider augmenting the main manual with other materials such as a case study or job aid. The designer is also going to develop assessment items for procedures. When doing so, research suggests that the best way to assess the learning of procedures is to evaluate the performance of a procedure. In 2000, researchers Schrock and Coscarelli determined that this can be done through the use of a yes-no comments type of checklist for the evaluator where the evaluator can mark the checklist appropriately while observing the learner perform the procedure. The instructional designer can successfully develop material to teach procedures. Keep in mind these things when developing instruction for procedures. Develop and test to the apply level of learning rather than to the remember level. Break up long and complicated procedures into smaller steps and use action and decision tables where appropriate. Follow along methods work and providing practice goes a long way in supporting the idea of teaching to the apply rather than remember level. Finally, assess the learning by evaluating the performance of a procedure. If the instructional designer focuses effort on developing instruction to teach procedures at the apply level, the likelihood that success will be achieved will go up and the learner will be better served.